There's a young lady that's going to be uh, passing around fruit smiles. Some of you need to put a smile on your face this morning, okay? Somebody said once, are you happy? Then tell your face. <laughs> Woo! That is good. Um, Cleo, that's my, my lovely wife. His name is Cleo, and uh, she's older than I am, in case you're wondering. Uh, well, some people wonder, you know, who's that, you know, so I'm just saying, okay? Um, I've been, uh, let's see, this is my fifth Sunday here at uh, River of Life. Uh, three in a row, and I've had two in a row now, and I've been talking about the Holy Spirit. First three messages were basically on the, whole, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit and being baptized with the Holy Spirit and receiving uh, a wonderful new language. Um, it's uh, one that you didn't have to study. The Holy Spirit just gives you a new language called speaking in tongues, okay? You don't have to go through a two-year course or anything like that. The Holy Spirit just gives it to you, and boom, you got a heavenly language just like that. Uh, and then I moved into the, uh, like last week and this week, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And I really believe that um, one of our purposes as Christians is to uh, display the character of Jesus. It says that in Romans 8, 29. That, you know, the, the purpose that God has called, called us to is to be like His Son. And the fruit of the Spirit uh, certainly is the character of Jesus. And I really believe that, um, you know, our world today, wherever you are, wherever you go, wherever you work or walk or play, uh, whatever the case, shop, um, people need to experience, they need to taste and see that God is good. And they do that by experiencing from us the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we're sort of like uh, on display, as it were. And uh, if you drive past the John Deere dealership, they have all their tractors and stuff out front on, on display. Why? Because they're hoping that you'll see one that you like and you'll, and you'll come in and maybe do some shopping. Uh, or uh, River of Life here. You have your sign out front, you know, that with the worship times. Why? Well, it's a sign on display hoping that it will catch the attention of people. Or if you walk downtown, the numerous shops down there have display windows. And they, they put things in the window. Hopefully that will attract customers to come in. And we want customers. We want people to in a sense, buy into Jesus, okay? I realize we don't earn our salvation, but I think you know what I'm saying. We're really on display. And, and, and so what if uh, somebody uh, really needed some joy in their life and the Holy Spirit knew that, that um, you were bearing that fruit of joy, they could link up could link up a person with you that needed that joy for the day, that, you know, there's just the joy of the Holy Spirit. And when they left you, perhaps they would have a, a fruit smile on their face, okay? I mean, I think when people leave us, um, for the most part, they really should leave having a good taste in their mouth for the Lord. Doesn't the Scripture say, taste and see that God is good? Well, how do you do that? Well, you hook up with other Christians. You know, you walk with other Christians. You taste and see that God really is good. And so we need... Uh, to display the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And so last week I said that um, it's the Holy Spirit that produces the fruit. We don't, we don't struggle to produce this fruit, okay? Uh, it's, uh, it's something that the Holy Spirit produces in us. We don't grit our teeth and, you know, jut out our chin and say, you know, oh, I'm going to have self-control today. Now, you might have to do that in certain situations, where self-control is called for, but you will learn through the course of time, as the Holy Spirit produces that fruit in you, there is no effort. There's no effort to it. Now, we may have to put on a joyful face at times when we don't want to, and that's okay. We need to do that. But when the, when the fruit of the Holy Spirit of joy is, is <clears throat> excuse me, produced in your life, there will be no effort because the Holy Spirit produces it, okay? The only effort that we place into this is what I said before. There, there are three things, well, there's more than three things, but I, I talked about three nutrients that the Holy Spirit needs to produce the fruit within us. And one is, is that we feed on the Scriptures. We, we, we need to feed on the Scriptures, okay? We don't need to understand the Scriptures, but we do need to read. We do need to feed upon the Word of God. And I, went, I talked about that last week. And, and the idea is this, well... I don't have to understand the word, but I need to read the word. It's just like when I eat food. 
I don't understand how the body breaks all that food down and then uses it so that I can grow. But, be, but I have never, ever, it's never, ever kept me from eating because I didn't understand it. Okay? So I encourage you, you know, just go to the Word, feed on the Word. And if you're wondering how that works, listen to the message from last week. And then the second thing that, that, that the Holy Spirit needs as far as nutrients to produce this fruit is he needs obedience to the Word. Not only do we need to uh, read the Word, but we need to obey the Word. Whatever we understand about the Word, we need to obey it. And then the third thing is that um, when you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and, and he's given you that language, you know, prayer language. So you just go and you pray in tongues. Remember I said that stirs up the Holy Spirit within us, okay? So that there's just more production going on for the fruit of God, okay? So today, uh, Mary, what I'm going to do is just move down to the, or uh, I'm sorry, Matt's back there. <laughs> um, we're going to go to, to uh, uh, slide three, okay? Just my theme today, all right? All um, right. And the theme is Holy Spirit fruit too. That, that would be the theme, okay? And the big idea is this. If you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, uh, fruit will grow. If you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, fruit will grow. So let's just, uh, let's just pray. Uh, come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let this food to us be blessed. Thank you, Lord, for this food. Amen. That's a good prayer to pray every time you open your Bible, okay? I know we know it as a table prayer, don't we? Before we sit down to eat a meal. When you open your Bible, what are you doing? Man, you're sitting down for a meal. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, okay? Uh, I think if you click one more time, Matt, I think that, that um, there we go, the big idea. The big idea, if you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you, fruit will grow. And then uh, Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. Remember that. It's the Holy Spirit that produces. Again, I, we don't agonize over this at all. We just feed on the scriptures, we obey, we pray in tongues, and the Holy Spirit will eventually produce this fruit. And I think I said last week, you'll be in a situation and you'll be amazed. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe how patient I was in this situation. Two years ago, I never would have been that way. Why, do you, why is that a surprise? Well, because the Holy Spirit's been producing that fruit, and it just came out. And you didn't struggle with it at all. You just happened to be patient. Okay? So, uh, last week I talked about love, joy, and peace. So we'll, today we're going to hit patience. Patience. And the King James Version, uh, instead of using the word patience, it uses the word long-suffering. Okay? I think many, many of you gals uh, today uh, can probably relate to long-suffering. Right? You've just, you've suffered. Uh, the guy that you married was, wasn't exactly what you expected, so you've been long, I mean, Cleo's been long suffering for 41 years, so anyway, but, almost 42, but, almost 42, but who's counting, she said, so, uh, but she is older than I am, so uh, anyway, uh, so I always expect that, that she bears better fruit than I do, okay, because she's had two more years for the Holy Spirit to produce in her, all right, so I'm not exactly where she is right now, but anyway, you know, there's a good, uh, Kind of a good example, a good illustration of, the, of, of, of patience is if you've ever seen a, been around a gold Labrador, a, a, you know, a dog, gold Labrador, you know, with kids, they, they might be laying there and the kids are jumping all over them and pulling their ears and their tail, poking them in the eyes. And lab, they just kind of sit there and every now and then they might get up and walk over and, and then lay down over here. And then the kids come and they do the same thing. And they're just, they're just very patient. But a, a New Testament uh, illustration for uh, patience would be an ox uh, hooked up to a plow, okay? And this ox is, you know, and the master, of course, is uh, behind the plow, and the ox is just bringing this plow through the field, and no matter how, how tough the ground is, no matter how many rocks are there or, or, or big clumps of sod, it doesn't matter what that plow hits. The ox just keeps on going and going and going. It doesn't matter uh, how hot the day is, how humid it is, how many flies or gnats or mosquitoes there are, or if there's a, a strong headwind, the ox just patiently uh, listens to the master and just goes and goes and goes. And so whatever we face in life, this, this patience um, gets us through. Um, I, I said something about marriage. Well, uh, spouses need to be patient with each other, okay? We're not all uh, at, the, at the same level of growth. So, so patience needs to come forth. Uh, parents with children. 
You know, maybe your children don't live up to all your expectations, but the fruit of the Holy Spirit will give you patience. You know, when they turn up rocks in your lives or they turn up the heat in your lives, okay? You just, you're patient with your kids. Um, teachers with students, friends with friends, uh, pastors with congregations. Just, you know, need to be patient, okay, with the congregations. Um, and, and here's the deal. If the fruit of the Spirit of patience isn't in you, you'll find out that you're going to be one frustrated person, one frustrated individual uh, when, the, when the fruit isn't allowed to grow, okay? And the other thing is people find hope when they're around people with patience. I mean, your, your children will grow um, much better and have more confidence in themselves and won't always be looking over their shoulder to see if they've done things right if you're patient with them. I mean, patience is, has, has a, is just a, a great way to raise kids and to build self-confidence in them, patience. I was um, working at the sugar mill back in 74 through 79. I started there in the fall of 74 during the campaign season, and my boss uh, took a liking to me, and he said, you know, Dan, if you, want a, if you want a full-time job out here at the sugar mill, he said, you need, you need to uh, learn how to weld. And I said, well, I don't know how to weld. He said, well, I'm willing to teach you. He said, when we get, when we get done running the beats, there'll be about a month or so, uh, you know, four to six weeks, when we'll be cleaning everything up before they let you go. And he said, during that time, we'll work after hours. I will teach you how to weld if you want to do that. I said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So a week went by, he was teaching me, and I, I just couldn't get it. And two weeks went by, and I couldn't get it. And three weeks went by, and I just, I, you know, I wasn't getting it. Um, he was trying to teach me how to weld, you know, going up, a, a vertical weld. And my stuff would just glob. I mean, it would look like, just like little rocks of weld. It looked terrible. And, uh, and at the end, but at the end of the fourth week, I came to, I, I, it was after work, we, we started, and all of a sudden, I got it. I got it. And, but for four weeks, he was encouraging me. He was patient with me. He never said I couldn't get it. He said, Dan, you'll get it. It'll come. He, and, he, and he said, I guarantee you, one day you will walk in here and you'll get it. But it was his patience with me that gave me the confidence to keep going, to keep trying. Okay? Now, he didn't say, oh, man, you're not going to get it. You, you and welding, that, it just doesn't work for you. He never said that. And, and so I learned how to weld, and I, and I found out later he had kind of, he told my boss I knew how to weld before I knew how to weld, so there was confidence there. But I got the job, and I was there five years before I went off to Bible school. Um, 2 Timothy 2.24, uh, Paul says this, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Wow. You know, difficult people will find hope being around you if you're patient with them. Uh, in fact, <laughs> I can't imagine how difficult I've been for God. And I find my greatest hope in the patience of the Lord. It just gives me hope to know God and how patient he is with me. In fact, Second uh, Peter, Peter said this, you know, as far as the Lord delaying coming back, you know, we sang that song this morning, there's going to be a glorious day when the Lord comes back. And Peter said this about that. He said, you know, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, you know, his promise to come back, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. Because he doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. He wants everyone to repent and know him. Think of the patience of God. Think of what God has had to endure over the centuries. You know, people cursing him shaking their fist in his face, uh, all these things. And yet our patient God just keeps, you know, moving on. And we have hope for our neighbors, hope for our kids, hope for our relatives that they will one day receive Jesus. That, that's the fruit of patience. Let's look at kindness. Kindness is being adaptable to people and their needs. That's what kindness is. Kindness is, it's willing to be interrupted, okay? Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's not having, uh, always having to have your own way. I know there's, there's many times Cleo's come to me and she said, you know, Dan, why do we always have to do what you want to do? And, uh, and of course, inside I'm thinking, well, because what I want to do is really the best thing to do at this time, but I don't say that. And then, you know, why do we always have to do things your way? And I, I probably get that from my mother 
But, um, but you know, one of the reasons, yeah, she says yes. But, but you know, the reason we do things my way is because it's, you know, it's the best way, right? I mean, so, but, but no, it's, uh, that really isn't kindness, okay? And we, um, let's see. <laughs> Yikes. It's going to be a nice ride home today, you know, from uh, here to Fergus. It's, uh, we will both get to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit today. Uh, but here's the deal. Kindness asks questions like this, okay? We're just, we're, uh, just completing a, a, a marriage uh, seminar at Hilltop, and uh, it's called Laugh Your Way to a Better Marriage. But I guarantee you, if you would ask your spouse these next three questions that I'm going to read, actually it's four questions, I guarantee you, you will have a better marriage. Here's the first one. How can I be different for you? I should have had them up on the slides. I don't. I, I, I kind of made a mistake there. How can I be different for you? Is there anything that I can change that will help you? Is there anything that I can change that will help you? Is there anything that I can do better for you? Is there anything that I can do better for you? And then the fourth one, how can I serve you and meet your needs more effectively? How can I serve you and meet your needs more effectively? The first time... That's true, you do. The first time that I asked Cleo these questions, she got this scared look on her face, grabbed her cell phone, called 911, and she said, help, there's a stranger in my house. It's like, whoa. So anyway, you, you might get that type of response. But think about this. Jesus was willing to be interrupted for us. I mean, he's in heaven. <laughs> But he interrupted his life in heaven to, well, we took communion this morning. He interrupted his life to come here for us. That's kindness, okay? Um, kindness, I mean, without kindness, we're just sort of selfish pigs, aren't we? Without kindness. Philippians 2, 3. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And again, that's probably a real struggle to obey that verse. And at first it might take effort, but as the Holy Spirit produces the fruit, that verse will be effortless. Eventually it will be effortless because that fruit is just produced in you. 1 Corinthians 4. Look, look at what Paul said. We, he said we work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to this present moment. So not everybody is going to accept your kindness. Have you ever felt like you are the world's trash? Well, you know, it's okay, because now you're right up there with a level with Paul and Jesus. Somebody treated you like the world's trash. Well, put a smile on your face. Hey, it's, a, it's an honor. Let's look at goodness. Some of these I think you'll, you probably uh, don't realize the, the definition. It's probably different than what you thought. Goodness might be one of these. Um, to be actively generous or benevolent, particularly with finances. That's goodness. It's more than just giving out of our surplus. It goes beyond writing a check, you know, putting it in the offering, or writing a check to your favorite charity, um, 
Goodness is giving according to our ability. And do you realize that most people do not give according to their ability? I don't know that I give according to my ability at times. Uh, and here's, the, here's why I say that. Uh, the Lord Jesus um, showed us, uh, gave us an illustration in the New Testament of, of what he looks at when it comes to giving. And he took his 12 disciples, he's got the 12 guys, he says, hey, let's go to church. And let's just kind of camp out at the offering plate. So let's, I want you to watch the people putting you know, their money into the offering plate. So here we got 12 guys in Jesus, there's 13 of them, and they're watching, and people are coming along, and, and the, the story is in, in Mark chapter 12, um, right at the end of the chapter. And apparently there were a number of rich people, and they were, they were putting in bags of money, okay? They were coming along, they're throwing these bags of money, and Jesus never said a thing. Just, uh, you know, didn't seem to catch his attention. And then there was this a little lady, I don't know if she was little, maybe she was tall, who knows, but she was a widow. Her husband had died, okay, she was a widow. And she comes, and she puts her hand in her pocket, she takes out two little pennies, and she throws them in the deal. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes alive. It's like he wakes up, he's, hey, did you guys see that? That lady put in two pennies, and that's all she had to live on. That caught his attention. Why? Because I believe that when Jesus looks at what we give, he doesn't look at what we give. He looks at what we have left. That's something. That's goodness. The fruit of goodness. And so she gave out of her ability. She had the ability to put in those two pennies, even though it was the, you know, the last two that she had. It was an ability. Okay, I'm not saying we have to do this. All I'm saying is, is that Jesus just, you know, looks at what we have left, and goodness, we give out, we give out of our uh, ability uh, to give. And, and uh, one of the questions that I would really like to ask Jesus when I get to heaven is, what happened to the widow? I just want to know, what happened, okay? Did Jesus, did you somehow bless her? Did she, you know, uh, <laughs> I don't know, okay? She gave all she had to live on, so what's she going to do after that? Anyway, 2 Corinthians 8. <laughs> um, Paul says, now I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, what God in his kindness has done through the churches in Macedonia. They are being tested by many troubles. They are very poor, but they are also filled with abundant joy. So there's a lot of, you know, the fruit of the Spirit going on here, um, which is overflowed in rich generosity. For I can testify that they gave not only what they could afford, but far more. And they did it of their own free will. They begged us again and again for the privilege of sharing in the gift for the believers in Jerusalem. They were giving money because there was a famine in Jerusalem and some people were starving. Uh, they even did more than we hoped for. Their first action was to give of themselves to the Lord and to us just as God wanted them to do. But what caught my eye in here was the fact that these people begged to be able to give more. Wow. Wow. You ever put a, a lid on the offering out there and then somebody comes in, no, I want to give more. I want, please, please, I want to give more. I, I don't think any pastor's ever experienced that. It'd be a wonderful experience, but anyway. So goodness, goodness is, you know, giving out of our ability, okay? Uh, faithfulness, faithfulness, so some words that describe it, devoted, uh, trustworthy, dependable, uh, reliable, constant, unwavering. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, Paul says this, you've heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. So um, Paul was saying to Timothy, he said, find people that are faithful. Find people that you can teach the scriptures to, and then they'll go and teach those same scriptures to other people, or they'll live them out. Faithful people, okay? When they hear the word, they're going to be faithful to, to speak it to someone else and also, you know, to live that word out. Um, so here's the deal. We can trust God. I believe, you know, God has been faithful. Certainly he's been faithful to us. Uh, he's certainly been patient, patient with us. And so we can trust God for his faithfulness. But here's, here's the question. Can God trust us to be faithful to him? Are we faithfully feeding on the scriptures? Are we faithful to obey? Faithful to witness? Faithful to pray? Um, faithful to trust God. You know, sometimes God allows troubles into our lives. He allows us to be in some sticky situations. Are we faithful to trust him? 
in those situations. Say, you know what? I know God. You brought this down the pike. You allowed this to happen. You got something in mind, so I'm just going to be filled with joy here. And I'm just going to trust you. You're up to something. I don't know what it is, but let's, let's see what happens here, okay? Are we faithful? Uh, there's an there's a excellent illustration in the Old Testament on faithfulness. It's in, uh, found in Jeremiah uh, chapter 35. And um, God told Jeremiah uh, one day, he said, I want you to uh, go out to the, to the Rechabites. And he said, I want you to invite these Rechabites to church. Invite them into the church, uh, get some tables out, put some glasses in front of them, and pour some wine for them. And, and, and say, hey, look, guys, here, here's wine. It's from the church. It's okay to do this from the Lord. I'm going to pour some wine for you. I'd like you to drink it. And, and God told Jeremiah, he said, go, go and do that. Will, will you just do that? And uh, what happened was, is uh, Jeremiah did, invite the Rechabites in, set the glasses out, pour the wine, but they wouldn't touch it. They would not drink. The, even a prophet from God, giving them permission, they would not touch the wine. And uh, what's the deal? Well, Jeremiah 35, 14 says this. The Rechabites do not drink wine to this day because their ancestor, Jehonadab, told them not to. Jehonadab lived 300 years earlier. He was a relative of Moses' father-in-law. So 300 years ago, up to this time, Jehonadab said to his people, look, I, I don't want you drinking wine just don't want you to do that, okay? I don't want you living in houses. I want you to live in tents. I want you to uh, be mobile people. And of course, the idea here, what he was trying to teach them is, this world's not our home. Don't get too comfortable here. There's another world coming. But here's the thing. This was just a word from a man to his people, and generation after generation after generation, they were faithful not to drink wine. And that impressed God, and look at what he says. But I have spoken to you. So God says, but I've spoken to you again and again, and you refuse to obey me. Then Jeremiah turned to the Rechabites and said, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. You've obeyed your ancestor Jehonadab in every respect, following all his instructions. Therefore, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says. Jehonadab son of Rechab, will always have descendants who serve me. And that blessing, I believe today, is this. If, if we're faithful, if we're faithful to God and faithful to the Scriptures, we can hold God to the promise that generation after generation that goes from us, they will be living for the Lord. Somebody in that generation is going to be living for the Lord because of our faithfulness. And the New Testament promise is in Ephesians 6, where, you know, children obey your parents and the Lord. Um, for this is the right thing to do, and it's the first commandment, and that you will live long on the earth. Faithfulness brings a wonderful blessing to it. Gentleness. Gentleness is uh, meekness, uh, humility, courteousness, uh, strength under control. Gentleness would be, uh, I like that, strength under control. Gentleness would be like, like a horse that, you know, that, that a fellow breaks. They don't break the spirit of the horse, but they break the horse so that it'll take the bit, it'll take the bridle, it'll take the blanket, it'll take the saddle, and it'll obey the promptings of the rider. There's a lot of strength there in that horse. I mean, at any time, a horse could, you know, could buck a guy off and, and kill him with his hooves. We know that. But it's gentle because uh, its spirit uh, was... was you know, they say break a horse. The spirit wasn't broken, but you know what I'm saying. It was, uh, I, I can't think of another word uh, other than broken. <laughs> it wasn't crushed. The spirit of the horse wasn't crushed. It was just broken to serve the master. That's, that's gentleness. So, so with us, gentleness is this. We accept the dealings of God in our life. Like, like the horse accepts the rider and accepts the promptings, you know, uh, doing the reins thing, or, or some, you know, do with their knees. They'll touch a horse on one side, it knows where to go. Uh, and so, a gentleness, the fruit of gentleness accepts what God brings down the pike of life. And Mary, mother of Jesus, would be a good example. You know, she's a teenager, and, um, you know, and, the, and an angel of the Lord comes and says, you know, uh, you're going to have a baby, you're going to be pregnant, you're going to have a baby, and and, you, and this baby is going to be the son of God. And so, and Mary uh, said this, 
which is, you know, really interesting, she responded. She said, look, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And, and of course, you know, we know it, it put Mary in a sticky situation because after a while, she's going to look like she's pregnant, and then she's going to have to go to her mother and just say, uh, you know, Mom, I, um, I'm, uh, I don't know how to say this to you, but uh, I, I'm, I'm pregnant. And, of course, Mom, so, what? I, I, thought, I thought Joseph had more self-control than I, th I thought he could wait. Well, Mom, it's not, it's not um, it wasn't Joseph. Oh, it wasn't Levi down the street, was it? No, Mom, no, no. Uh, Mom, the, uh, the initials were uh, H.S., what? Hezekiah Shabazz? Are you kidding me? I mean, you see, just, just think about that. I mean, she had to, so what, so she tells her mom, no, it was, um, you know, God made me pregnant. I mean, come on. You know, if one of your daughters that came to you and said, gave you that thing. But here's the deal. Mary, see, the fruit of gentleness accepted God's dealing in her life. Now, Maybe a little bit more, one that we can relate to a little bit more. What about Job? We all, you know from reading at least the first chapter of Job, or the first two chapters, you know that Job worshiped the Lord, and yet God allowed, he allowed Satan to deal with Job. You know, Job lost, you know, all of his cattle, all of his servants, all of his camels, and, and all of his kids. I mean, they were just, that was it, wiped out. He was completely wiped out, Okay. Now, this fruit of gentleness rises up because Job said this. You know, his wife was mad. She said, what, are you going to maintain your te integrity now? Just curse God and die. And, but this is Job's response, Job 2.10. You talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad? So in all this, Job said nothing wrong. I mean, think about that, folks. Do we need the fruit of gentleness? Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. I mean, because there are many things, and I look back in my life, there are a lot of things I didn't want to accept, and I didn't accept them very graciously. And God wants to produce. Can you see how people could be drawn to the fruit of gentleness? I mean, we're here on this earth to win people for Jesus. The fruit of gentleness, I mean, that's a fruit snack. That's a fruit smile. I mean, wouldn't you like to be around people that, that have the fruit of gentleness that no matter what they're going through in life, they're not cursing God. You know, they're not down in the dumps. They're not depressed. They're not discouraged because they know, they know God's up to something. And what it is, they're going to wait it out and see. Okay? So, you know, just because things aren't going right for you, uh, say at your job, doesn't mean you're supposed to leave. Maybe that's the Holy Spirit wanting to bring forth that fruit of gentleness. Or even in churches. You know, at Hilltop uh, in Fergus, we've had ups and downs. Man, I'm telling uh, and I still don't know the answer to this one, but I would say six years ago, about six years ago, six, seven years ago, um, we had a sanctuary that seated about 165 people. And we were full. We were full on a Sunday morning. So what we did is, is we thought we would do a Saturday night service, and that would alleviate, you know, some of the, uh, make more room on a Sunday morning. So we did. Went to a Saturday night service, and that really didn't make more room. We just, uh, uh, some of the people that came, uh, came from, you know, they would normally go Sunday morning, so they came Saturday night, but then there were others um, that came from the community. But then Sunday morning, we found that some of those that were there Saturday night came Sunday morning too. So then we went to two services on Sunday and Saturday night. So we had three services, and that did alleviate the room. And then finally, what we did is, uh, so we probably had 250 people, something like that, uh, attending. And then we uh, decided, you know what, let's enlarge the sanctuary. We'll just make it twice the size. So we did. Cut back Saturday. We didn't have Saturday night service anymore. Only had one service on a Sunday. And then slowly over the next year or two, we lost about 100 people. I have no reason why. Um, but what I'm saying is, I accept that as somehow that was the will of God. Um, I don't know what he's up to. Things are starting to percolate again. 
It'd grow a little bit more, but I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I don't get it. But the, the thing of it is, um, if there's uh, things that you don't like in the church or whatever, I don't know why all those people left, but I don't think it was always, I don't think all of it was the will of God. Because sometimes you go through rough patches in church. It doesn't mean you should leave. Again, maybe the Lord wants you to produce the fruit of gentleness. And, and I think a lot of times people miss out on the leading of the Holy Spirit when a tough time comes and they go instead of exhibiting that fruit. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm camping on gentleness just a little bit more. For some reason, I think the Lord wants me to. But gentleness needs to find its expression in our everyday lives like this. Gentleness is, cur is being courteous. It's just, it's being courteous, okay? Maybe opening the door for someone or, you know, carrying a bag of groceries or helping around the house, just being courteous. Or returning a phone call, answering an email, sending out a thank you, uh, being on time for a meeting or work, uh, having a homework assignment done, uh, phoning when you're going to be late, uh, and showing up for an interview, we always talking to, uh, there's a grocery store in uh, Fergus that opened up Aldi's. I think it opened up last year. And Cleo was in there one day, I was talking to the manager, and, and uh, she asked, do you still need help? And this guy apparently had come over, had, had driven up that day from Alexandria because, St. Cloud. Cloud, he'd driven up from St. Cloud because he was going to have an interview with a person in Fergus to get a job. And when he got there, the person never showed up for, for the interview. So he drove all the way from St. Cloud for nothing. This person didn't show up. Uh, that person needed the fruit of gentleness, okay? Um, because, here's the deal, what, what that person said to the guy coming to do the interview is that my time is more important than your time. In fact, I'm more important than you are. 1 John 3.16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for others, for our um, for our brothers and sisters. And then again, first Philippians 2, 3, the idea of don't be selfish. But the last thing on gentleness that I want to say is this. Gentleness is the power to control your attitude. Okay? If you didn't hear anything else on gentleness, hear this one. It's the power to control your attitude. How do you respond when you're insulted? How do you respond when you're treated unfairly or don't get your way? And here's the other thing. Jesus said this. He said, you know, I didn't come to be served. He said, I came to serve. And he said to his disciples, and he said, you know, and particularly, he said, the, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. So now here's the question. How do you act when you're treated like a servant? Um, for instance, you're not complimented on the good job you do. You're on the receiving end of orders. Somebody orders you around. And you, or others act like you don't exist. You were just treated like a servant. What's your attitude? See, gentleness is the power to control your attitude. Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer deflects anger but harsh words make tempers flare. Last one, self-control. Words that would describe it. Restraint, moderation, balance, and temperance. Now, as gentleness was the power to control your attitude, self-control is the power to control your passions your appetites, your desires, and the imaginations of your mind. See, things start in the mind, okay? Your mind can go sex on you. It can go chocolate cake on you. Here's the deal. The body only goes where the mind has already been. Because if you didn't think about it, you wouldn't be doing about it. You wouldn't be doing it. I mean, if you weren't thinking about chocolate cake, you wouldn't be eating it. So the body goes where the mind has already been. And God has given us many good things to enjoy in this life, okay? But without self-control, good things can become harmful things. 
uh, like sex. Sex is good, uh, but we need self-control. Food, power, money, work, toys, material goods, they're all good things, but the fruit of self-control gives us the power to control those desires and passions. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Again, in other words, you won't do it unless you're thinking it. Uh, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37, Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Well, how do you love God with your mind? Think about that, because I, I know sometimes we can just read that verse and quickly go on to the next verse, but how do you love God with your mind? Well, you think about good things. See, once you, once you sense that you're thinking something that you shouldn't be thinking, you move that thing out and you start thinking good. Why? Because you want to love God with your mind. That one just caught my attention this last week. Is, am I loving God with my mind? So and then I start, I start thinking about the thoughts I'm thinking. God, does this love you? It did, oh, and, and so immediately you can move that thought out and bring a good thought in. Isn't that wonderful? That we can love God with our mind. Now get this. If we're loving God with our mind, chances are we'll be loving him with our body, right? Because the body goes where the mind has already been. What a sweet thing. Um, and then Luke twenty-two sixty-one. 61. Uh, is this, uh, after Peter had uh, he'd, uh, denied the Lord, and, uh, and here's the verse says, at, the, at that moment, remember Peter denied the Lord three times. At that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Suddenly, the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, tomorrow morning you will deny three times that you even know me. And then it says after that verse, Peter went out and wept. But the words I want you to catch in there is as the words flashed through Peter's mind. See, there was the word of God that flashed into his mind. And then he realized, I've sinned. I've denied my Lord. And that word caused him to weep and repent and thank God for forgiving him. And so these, these messages that we preach on the, on the fruit of the Holy Spirit, hopefully the word of God will flash into your mind. You know, and you'll think about, oh, yes, you know, if I feed on the Scriptures, it'll produce a fruit. If I obey, it'll produce a fruit. If I pray in the Spirit, it'll produce a fruit. So the, we want the Word of God to flash through our minds. And, that's, and I believe when we think about the Word of God, that's loving God. Loving God with our minds. Probably the, one of the best examples in the Old Testament is, is Joseph. Um, Genesis 39, remember Joseph... Uh, was given a, a good place in Potiphar's household. And he was alone, you know, with Potiphar's wife one day. And Potiphar's wife wanted to uh, have sex with him. Uh, I think the Bible says, uh, you know, would you sleep with me? Well, she didn't want to sleep. We know that. So uh, basically is, will you have sex with me now? And, and, and Joseph, you know, here he is loving God with his mind. Look at it in Genesis 39, 9. No one has more authority than I do. Um, he, talking about Potiphar, has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. That was a good thought to think, right? That's Potiphar's wife, okay? How could I do such a wicked thing? Isn't that a good thought to think that sin is wickedness? We don't think that way in our society, that it's wickedness. We have smooth words for, uh, you know, having an affair, why don't we just call it what it is? Wickedness. That's what it is, isn't it? Um, and, so, and then he says, how could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. See how Joseph loved God with his mind? All these good thoughts going through. And so where did his body go? Where his mind had already been out the door. Just went out the door because of his mind. So, Our world definitely needs Holy Spirit fruit snacks or fruit smiles. The church needs fruit snacks. You know, I believe, okay, just my belief, okay? I believe that if the church, us, people, everywhere, 
were producing and aware of the Holy Spirit producing the fruit in us, it would make us attractive. It would make us attractive. I mean, everybody needs a fruit snack. They tasted good this morning, didn't they? So when people come in contact with us, we want them to taste good. Well, if they come to churches and they have a good taste, they'll come back. The world needs the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We need the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And again, we need to let, it, let the Holy Spirit produce it again by what? The same thing we do to have our, bodies, to have our bodies grow. We feed ourselves, we drink water, and we sleep. Okay, three things. Well, it's for the nutrients to produce the fruit of the Spirit. We feed on the Word of God. We obey the Word of God. We pray in the Spirit. It's kind of a simple thing. Um, so, there you have it. Any questions or comments that you might want to make? Any? You thought Cleo was younger than me, okay? I, I, whatever it is. I, okay. Uh, and uh, thank you for listening in TV land, wherever you might be. <laughs> but how about if we let the Holy Spirit produce fruit? Let's let him produce fruit. And uh, I told Cleo, I said, you know what? I need to keep this message out, and I need to read it once a week. I, I just do. I, I thought it was a good one. And I, I need to read it and allow the Holy Spirit to produce this fruit in me. I, I look at some things. I should be more mature than I am in areas, and I want to let the Holy Spirit produce that fruit. So do we, do we, um, are we going to, uh, wait a minute. Uh, Ma'am, I don't know your name, but I just uh, believe that the Holy Spirit really loves it when you worship, when you express yourself in worship. And I don't know if you do it at home or not, but uh, do more of it at home. Raise your hands at home, dance, clap, sing to the Lord because he loves it when you worship. Just, uh, wanted to encourage you with that. Um, okay, thank you for listening this morning.